Welcome to the podcast again, Dave. Thanks for having me back. Nice to be so back. Good to, yeah, it's been a while. I think it was maybe probably two years ago when we did the first one. Are you shitting um, me? Yeah, and I think you were actually the first um, video podcast episode that I did, if I'm if I'm not mistaken. So mm. it's good to circle back around. I've been wanting to do this with you for a while. Um, so my first question is... I mean, it's a, it's a tough one, but a simple one-ish. Um, how would you describe what Zen is and what has kept you drawn to it for all these years? Yeah, I thought about this, like how to um, answer what is Zen succinctly enough? Because, you know, yeah. we go on for 20 years like that. Yeah. But um, I think I want to give a practical answer. Mm -hmm. I think that's what gets missing a lot from a lot of these things is what because there's so many spiritual traditions and so many practices one could do so many questions of how do we approach the ineffable or the great question of who and what we are, you know, yeah. and there's an old word for that. And that's called religion. <laughs> religion is meaning making systems, right? And so if we're really being honest, Zen is one stream of that. It's an offshoot of Buddhism that, came, that kind of formed in China in a certain time and place for fascinating reasons and then got passed down kind of with the same name and some of the same traditions and approaches from about, I would say from about the year 600 to 700, you see what I would kind of recognize is like, yeah, that, that smells like Zen, mm. you know, in China. And that gets passed down through Japan where that again changes a lot. And then that got, pa and, and everyone acknowledges like when it moves, it changes. And then when it comes to America in the 20th century, it changes again. So uh, the real answer is it's an old religion that's been passed through certain places, changed along the way. And right now we are in a place where it is, we are defining what it's going to mean to us. And that's what I find fascinating is that we don't know what American Zen is yet. We know it will be different. We know it's changing. And we're in a, a, what seems like an intentionally slow process of figuring out how American culture and this passed down tradition are going to form each other, you know? what mm -hmm. the interaction is going to be like, how it's going to define what it's going to be. Yeah. Yeah. So that's vague and structural, I guess. It isn't like the fun. I like that. Thing. No, I like that. <laughs> and I mean, I, you know, I, you know so much about Zen history and I, I always appreciate picking your brain about that. Um, but so, I mean, I guess you always kind of have like this macro historical view of mm -hmm. Zen, which is cool. And I guess just the second part of that question was like, what is it specifically about this religious stream that's been um, passed down and transformed throughout the centuries? Um, what is it about Zen that that you feel like you kind of like more than other <laughs> religious streams? Yeah, and that's where we can get particular on what makes Zen Zen. You yeah. know, what makes it unique? Because you know, I did kind of do my browsing. Like, I knew I wanted something in my life that was going to be a spiritual tradition and a practice. And I kind of browsed them all. And I was like, what makes sense? And Zen did things that I haven't seen any. I've seen a lot of allusions to it in other and in, in, in elements of it in other traditions. But no, nothing else that kind of like quite got and streamlined the ironies and the jokes of ultimate truth that Zen was able to um, and was able to find a way to put it into practice, put it into form and make make it something, make something out of nothing. You know, <laughs> yeah. um, I would say the first I mean, the opening, the, the, the Heart Sutra line, form is emptiness, emptiness is form, is really the foundational thing. It's like a lot of traditions point you towards an ultimate truth, which usually has some degree of oneness. Buddhism, especially Mahayana Buddhism, was able to pinpoint that down as that oneness is ultimately empty, and that is something that is best realized experientially, but um, more so than philosophically. But when you put everything as oneness, that's empty. And then a lot of traditions would then get kind of stuck there and like getting you to that ultimate letting go of yourself to find the big one. Some might get you to recognize it as empty. And then Zen was the one, well, let's put it in two terms. In philosophical terms, they're the one who figure out that emptiness is incomplete if you don't include form, which means daily practical life. Um, if it's not grounded in your everyday life right here and right now with all of its, you know, 
annoyances and BSs and joys and triumphs and defeats and just your own little personal small self stuff, it yeah. has to include that. So you can't bypass the little self to get to a big higher understanding. The high understanding, if anything, leads you back down to your little self and then you start tending your own little garden. I thought that was beautiful. In literary terms, I think what really draws me to it and draws me back again over and over again, I trusted them because so many people selling the ultimate truth can become real exploitative real fast. There's a lot of um, opportunity for abuse, misunderstanding, even well-intentioned misunderstanding and things going off the rails because you get in some weird territory real fast. And what Zen did was they present that like, yeah, no, we've got it. We understand what enlightenment is. We understand what ultimate truth is. We've done it, done it. We've seen it. We've experienced it, and we're kind of over it. And I was like, <laughs> that's impressive. Nobody else is like over their own enlightenment to that degree. I was like, because the guy who's selling you enlightenment, right? I don't trust him because there's mm -hmm. going to be an end game there, right? The guy is like, yeah, whatever comes and goes. It's like that guy is not trying to sell me a line. That guy seems like he knows what he's talking about. You know, it's that that little bit of jaded that um is grounding and I think trustworthy. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's a, that's a great, that's a great point. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I, I guess most of my questions are related to Zen just because, you know, you're like, you're the person in my life who is the most dedicated Zen practitioner and the most knowledgeable about Zen. So why not, you know? Um, but yeah, so I guess I'm, I'm always curious about this question. I, I try to explore it for myself all the time, just, and I know you've thought a lot about it, um, just kind of the, the tension between the notion of no self, um, you know, confronting the fact of our own um, localized personhood in the world, you know, like, how do you navigate those two things at the same time? Yeah. And I'm going to do a bad Zen and I'm going to um, <clears throat> do it in levels. So step one is kind of to realize no self, right? And that does take some practice. It does take some training. It does take some will and volition and attention to like, I mean, so we just do Shikantaza Zazen, right? Which is just, um, it's just sitting. The irony of Shikantaza Zazen where it's, um, for anybody who doesn't know, it's a, um, what separates it from most meditations is that it's completely undirected goalless there's not a um, concentration practice there's not a point and there aren't graded levels in it um, which means you literally just sit sit down and stop trying to do anything else you just sit down and be and whatever happens that is you being you just pay attention to that and so um if you do that long enough and you just stare at yourself and there, a question kind of naturally arises the question is what is this <laughs> first what am i but also like what is this like you just have to you're just to, to pay attention is to be curious in a way. Those two things just go together. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, eventually you just unravel everything you've attached to that creates the structure of your identity. And once you see through them all, well, <laughs> you kind of fall away. And turns out that's weird. <laughs> <laughs> right. And again, one can get kind of lost there for a while. And that would be, I, I would think, lost in no self. There's a lot of writings on um, the dangers of being sick on emptiness, they call it. And so people mm. who kind of see themselves fall away and again, this is where I might like poke fingers at other um, traditions and get really entranced by their own spiritual woeness, you know. And then um, what it's done for me, though, is that then you stand up and you've got bills and you've got worries. And you've got to figure out if you're going to ask a person out that you met at a coffee shop and what to do. And you're sitting there thinking like, I just stared at myself, fall away and like realized stardust of the universe in my fingernails. And even that concept fell away two hours ago. And now I'm sitting here with butterflies in my stomach, wondering if I should go talk to this girl because my heart's beating too fast and my voice is going to be too nervous, you know? <laughs> and then what that becomes is funny. Like, it's funny to watch the <laughs> universe play itself out through my own little, like, I'm still going to have hormones. It's still going to play. I still have, like, conditioned karma and patterning and trauma and um, baggage. But seeing it in context and having that experience every day, <laughs> in a way, um, just makes me a lot funnier and it makes my like <laughs> neurotic brain it doesn't make it that less neurotic sometimes right. in some ways it does but really it makes the whole thing funnier and more entertaining you can take it with a grain of salt hopefully what we would call compassion is also taking other people with a grain of salt if i realize that my stuff is just a playing out of like cosmic stardust conditioning um then hopefully you can see that in other people too and so 
when they're giving you grief or they're being annoying or even when they're being awesome, you can see it all as more of what they would call an objective circumstance. And it's mm -hmm. a little bit less existentially troubling and it's a little bit less hard to blame people for being jerks. And it's actually, for me, it makes it easier to like kind of set boundaries and have healthy relationships with people. Not all the time, obviously. I'm not great at it, but it is easier to like see because I don't, let's say someone is being problematic in my life. I don't have to sit there and waffle over the fact that I'm existentially condemning them to put up some boundaries and walls, you know, just be like, no, it's right. not good for either of us. And it's kind of inconvenient. So I'll do that, you know? So yeah. I don't know. It makes life funnier and easier in a yeah. way, but doesn't change much. <laughs> that's the other, that's the whole joke is that nothing much really changes. It's just a different perspective on the same old BS you were grinding out yesterday morning. Right, 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 right. Well, yeah. And I think that that shift in perspective or the shift in attitude is a pretty big deal, though. So it's like that changes. And so even if the unfolding, you know, events don't necessarily change, that shift in perspective is like, you know, has a has a massive impact. Well, that's one of the teachings and one of the jokes, right, is that I think just intuitively, we all kind of start with this sense for some reason, well, what we can say, we've learned this sense that things are going in a trajectory and it, you feel kind of like stuck in that inertia, which is usually some sort of negative karma. Usually that's like your baggage and your trauma and your conditioning playing itself out in kind of a fatalistic way. That's like the tragedy, right? Is that your stuff, you have fatal flaws that will kind of doom you to whatever fate you were left to. And we kind of, we kind of, we just kind of play into it. We go to where we're comfortable, what we're used to, which is usually not healthy things. You know, the things we grew up on that really hurt us, things you remember the most, and we just keep replaying them out and replaying them out. But the point is, it's always change. Everything is always actually just changing. And so when you start to see your conditioning, see how you're playing into it, see what you're drawing and attracting into your life, what you're attached to, you just naturally don't play into the things that are unpleasant as much. And so, yeah, of course, your whole life gets better. <laughs> yeah. Because it can become yeah. much easier to make good choices because you're like, well, why wouldn't I make a good choice? Why wouldn't I ask for a raise or quit if that's the right thing to do, you know? Um, yeah. And so, yeah, of course, your life improves, but it doesn't feel much different because, it's yeah. just, you know? <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. But it does seem like there's a level of like disentangling um, automatic karma or something like that, you know? And that's, that's, that is a big deal. And, and the way I kind of in feel that happening when it does happen for me is like the spaciousness, you know, it's like, there's a certain spaciousness that gets cultivated. And when that spaciousness is not cultivated, then everything seems so tightly wound and just kind of automatic. But if you can kind of give a little bit of space there, then I think that you can start kind of redirecting some of the karma a little bit, at least. Absolutely. I was saying like practical terms, like the first benefit I ever noticed in meditation was that there became a lag time that I could notice, identify and operate in. And it's like a split second between something happening, and my reaction, somebody yep. says something to me. And all of a sudden there was like this moment of space between when I reacted to it. And I no longer had to yell back if I didn't want to. I no longer had to defend myself. I mean, I can see, I can see like the defense mechanism might be like, I must defend myself now. And it's like, oh, look, you're doing that. And right. then you have a moment of like, I don't know if you want to call it choice. We might get that later with the host and guest stuff. But um, there's a moment where something else can happen. And that wasn't yeah. there before. And that one moment changes every, you're right. It changes everything to have that moment of space. Yeah. And, you know, in my life, I feel like sometimes I can have that. And sometimes I can't, you know, it's like, I think that I've learned to be able to watch myself more. Like I like literally just kind of watch, uh, be more watchful of my own behavior. And that helps me. And that's similar. I guess it's kind of like the witness, the idea of the witness or whatever, mm -hmm. but regardless of how much I can watch myself, um, sometimes I still am kind of just completely entangled <laughs> in the um you know the conditioning or the automatic karmic momentum that it's like even with the awareness sometimes that doesn't allow me to have the the distance you know and that which can be is the most weird. maddening and kind of fun if you're up for it is like watching yourself it's almost like yeah because you're right sometimes especially the conditioning is so strong that you're just gonna do that next thing like they're actually the gap doesn't really give you space to play in it sometimes. Right. And yet my awareness of that is kind of always on now. 
And sometimes you just watch yourself doing the thing you do not want to do. And you're like, exactly. why is this still happening? Like every ounce of space and you're screaming like, stop. And you're like, exactly. I agree while you keep doing it. Yeah. <laughs> it's maddening. And it can, again, it can be hilarious. <laughs> and you can learn a lot if you can stick with it. I think that's why a lot of people turn back because that can be really uncomfortable. So in full awareness, witness yourself doing bad things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I like the, I like your attitude of, of the kind of, it makes life funnier. Um, I think that that's like extremely healing to kind of come from that approach. And um, just as a last note about all this, which uh, I kind of, it just baffles me that it's even possible though. Like if we think about just conditioning and karmic momentum or whatever, it's pretty mind bending that we can even cultivate that sort of awareness or that space within the context of karma, if that makes sense. Like, how is it even possible? And I guess to me, that's related to emptiness, right? Mm -hmm. It's like somehow an experiential confrontation with emptiness allows us to, to not just be um, locked in to the karma. I am fascinated by those moments like that when, you know, I was in um, school, I was in grad school for, for Buddhism and chaplaincy programs. They make you do a lot of um, spiritual formation exploration, right? So what was my spiritual formation? What formed me? What moments? One moment that I kept coming back to um, was, it was a moment in seventh grade when I got in my first fight. I, don't, I think we've talked about this, but I don't know. I think you mentioned this, but yeah, I keep going. Lot, um, and... To me, that moment is a lockbox of I don't know what happened or why. Because so the narrative of my life at that point was, you know, I'm a small kid. I played violin. I was a little too nerdy, a little too, um, I don't know, whatever. I was a kid who got beaten up and they still asked me to do their homework after they beat me up kind of a guy, right? And I would just take it. You know, I was just, I was pretty ineffectual. I was pretty self-conscious and shy and, and scared. And um, so in seventh grade, it was a rough school in Ohio, and there's a, you know, as usual after lunch, like one of the kids, a couple of the kids are like harassing me and like just shoving me from locker to locker, just back, mm. bam, 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 you know, it's like a common occurrence. Every day I would just take it. And one day, I don't know why, <laughs> I dropped my books, I turned around, I just started fighting the kid. And I was small and he was going to win, but um, he was just so shocked. The joke of the story was that he was so, so shocked that I fought back that he just stood there like, what the hell is happening? <laughs> For a good, again, I don't know how, how time worked in that moment, but it felt like a couple of minutes where you just like, why is this kid even trying to hit me, right? And I hit him in the head, I hit him in the face. I was like, I can do this, this is amazing. He got one shot on me, and then a teacher broke it up before anything else happened. And sort of the crowd witnessing, I had won the fight, and the short kid had just kicked Jairo Davis's ass was the story that went around the school. Mm -hmm. And the short kid's crazy don't fuck with him was the story that went around the school. And my whole life changed in that instant because people wow. treated me different. I saw myself differently. Yeah. I started, I got confidence. I started asking girls out. I started working out. I joined the wrestling team. Like, and I just became a confident, capable person from that one moment. And like, right. what caused that shift? That's a mystery because there's no reason in my history that I know of why I would have chosen to turn around and stand up for myself, you know? Yeah. And so I love that. Like, what made that? Because my whole life is different from there, you know? Yeah. No, I, yeah, I, I totally feel you. It, it, to me, it seems like grace or something like some weird, mysterious thing that it doesn't, it doesn't quite make sense. Um, but it's just kind of gifted to you <laughs> in a way. I like mystery, but I also, my, my brain likes to rationalize because I don't do sure. that that well with, um, non-rational explanations for too long i love it yeah. I like not knowing is a big part of what we practice but also my brain kind of needs the thing yeah me i too. kind of see it as like random chance you know what i mean there is often a moment of chance like if you roll the dice on enough things um one out of a thousand times the shy kid is going to turn around and fight back just mm -hmm. because that's going to happen sometimes in my life i had been picked on a thousand times so one time i fought back that was just right. going to happen you know i often see karma as the playing out of and this is my spin on the ultimate Buddhist teachings is that if we keep making the same mistakes over and over and over again and bumping into walls over and over and over again, mm -hmm. eventually we're going to stop and we're not going to make the same mistake again because we've just learned the lesson. You mm -hmm. know, I had just probably, I think maybe I answered my own question finally. <laughs> I had just been shat on so many times. I know what happens when I get shit on and walk away. Right. And at that point, after a thousand times of that, 
you just give up on what you know and you try something else and oh that worked so i'll keep going in that direction and sometimes if you when i watch human history i feel like that's kind of what we're doing we just keep we i don't think we learn by anything this is where i my my, my, my religious views come out because I'm, I'm a pretty hardcore secularist despite like having a lot of woo-woo in me yeah um there doesn't seem to be a guiding hand to our narrative as as humans what i see is people with a little bit of self-awareness who just keep bumping up against the same mistakes over and over again and they hurt every time until eventually like let's try something else and then yeah. we do that for a, a couple hundred years you know yeah um slowly becoming less violent as a species i think is just being like you know what that hurts and the less we can do it the happier we are so over the course of a, a, a few thousand years we just slowly get a little bit less violent as we can because we've learned the lesson that hurts and i think if we survive long enough, maybe we'll learn a whole lot of lessons and get a lot better at this. <laughs> right. No, I feel that too. And I mean, you know, when I say grace, I'm not necessarily saying it in some like traditional Christian sense or something. It's just a word that I use to describe when moments that feel like I don't, it doesn't quite line up with, um, yeah, just it's a moment of like novelty or something. And from what you're saying, like, um, I like moment of novelty because that would be great, yeah. right? The one time you roll the dice and they come out sevens. <laughs> like, okay. Yeah, yeah. So the novelty <laughs> and like the chance aspect and even chaos, you know, it seems like mm -hmm. it's like chaos is just intrinsic to to reality and chaos is what allows for novelty, you know? That's my, I, sorry, I'm, I'm coming up on this now. It's my favorite definition of grace I've ever heard because it does take some of the superstition out of the woo-woo there. Yeah. Is it like you are going to have a lot of things come up the way you don't want to. And once in a mm -hmm. while, for no discernible reason, things go your way. And we are kind of in a mechanistic universe, but we also have this weird sense of like will and desire on it. And once in a while, things go your way, and that's just a stroke of luck and grace. And that's a really nice way to like appreciate the moments when, you know what? My will and the universe align today, and I'm just going to count that as a blessing for no other reason. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> well, you know, I, I'm, t I'm tempted to go and there's two different questions I want to ask, but I, I think that just related to what we were just talking about, maybe it would be useful to jump into the, to the guest host dust thing. Mm -hmm. um, so I, you know, I listened to one of your most recent podcasts and you were talking about, what was the text that you were reading? Um, the Shur and Gama Sutra, one of my favorite texts of all time. In Buddhism. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, I can pass it to you and, and let you kind of explain what that text and your commentary about that in terms of the, the guest versus the host versus dust. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so I love the text. Just very briefly, it's um, a pretty late Mahayana Sutra. They, they didn't even call it apocryphal. Like, it was probably written in China um, in the 6, 700, which was pretty late. Most sutras were written at least by, like, by 1 or 200 A.D., so this one's probably a few hundred later, years later than that. And the frame story is hilarious. The frame story is that Ananda, who's Buddha's attendant, a celibate monk, gets caught in bed with a woman. And um, they haul him back before Buddha. And like, what are you doing <laughs> with the woman? And um, as usual, Ananda's character is that he never got enlightened while Buddha was alive. He's Buddha's closest attendant. He memorized everything the Buddha ever said. That's why the sutras are all just Ananda reciting what Buddha said after he had died. Um, and the joke was that even though he knew everything Buddha had said, he didn't get enlightened until after Buddha died. So most of the mm. sutras are Ananda just not getting it. And it's always really funny <laughs> and illuminating yeah. how Ananda doesn't get it. And so in this one, after a whole sutra of Buddha trying to help, ex help Ananda figure out why he can't keep his vows and why he doesn't have discipline or self-control, um, the woman who's in bed with, she gets enlightened and Ananda still doesn't get it by the end of the sutra. And that's just, <laughs> that's the way it goes. But, um... So what they do in the sutra is that the kind of thesis is that if we can figure out what we really are and what is really op um, engaging with reality, mm -hmm. then we get a lot more agency in it, you know, and it's a lot easier to keep your vows. If you know what the desire for sexuality comes from, it's a lot easier to keep your vow of chastity would be one thing to do it. For me, I think of procrastination. Like if I know where the desire to switch over from my work over to YouTube and waste 20 minutes comes from, then I'm less likely to, if I can watch that process, I'm less likely to actually switch over and procrastinate watching YouTube. Similar, same, same kind of a thing. But so what he does is he takes you down through just your awareness. So it's like first, a lot, a lot of focus on sense awareness. So what is um, my visual, what, what do I think my visual awareness is and what is it actually? I'm looking at a photograph right now. I'm looking at a golden trophy of a fish and we just take it for granted that that's a golden trophy of a fish and that's a photograph, right? But those are stories that I'm concocting out of quantum foam, you know? And the process that does that, they start to locate as 
you is the one who's kind of making that switch from quantum foam to golden fish in time and space. You know, and so finding that and being aware of that thing um, gives you a lot more agency over life is the frame. So I was really curious about choices because since we teach no self and there is ultimately emptiness and non-self, then what is that ultimate awareness? What is making my choices? You know, can I talk to them? <laughs> yeah. um, and because uh, Gyoke, my teacher, his metaphor was that in life, we are usually like the passenger trying to drive the car. We're sitting in a car, um, someone else behind the steering wheel, and we're trying to steer it from the passenger seat. And that's why we're always kind of screwing up because mm. not, the one we think is steering shouldn't really be steering. <laughs> right. Uh, the, the passenger. Our thoughts are the passenger. Our self-awareness is the passenger, not the um, driver. And so host and guest became a metaphor. Host would be the real you and guest would be the passenger. Guest is transient. Host is the one who inhabits the space, who attends the space, um, the space of you. So it's interesting. So the metaphor they came up with was that um, the guest would be like dust in sunlight. So that's kind of us. Our thoughts, our self-awareness, our will, our wants, our us is dust floating in sunlight um, in, a, in, a, in an empty room. And the room and the space is the host. And that's where it's empty. The ground that holds you as you think of you is an empty, open space. Call it that moment of grace, that moment of like space in between you and your decisions, you know? That's the real host. That's where everything is being held. And so then the question is, how do you work with that? Because <laughs> yeah. it's empty, right? The whole problem, that's why I like the dust metaphor so much, because as soon as you try to take control of space or the host, Mm -hmm. You're just batting dust through the air and asking yourself why the dust isn't going where you want it to, you know? And all it's doing is you're making more chaos in the room. It's just more, anytime you think you can control the host, you're just being the guest. That is all, that's all guest thinking, you know? That's all little-minded thinking. And that's the entire problem of self-improvement and trying to find ultimate self and ultimate reality. Um, yeah. So that's the brief. No, that's guest. good. That's good. And... I mean, you kind of already touched on this, but in the podcast, I was just really interested w in the differences that you were laying out between like um, host and guest versus guest and host versus host and host and all that stuff. So I know that's a little like, you know, that's kind of really detailed, but can you, can you like differentiate those? Yeah. So there, there's kind of these formulations of which again, Zen's not supposed to do this if we're following our own teachings correctly, but um, we kind of have to just talk, just use mm -hmm. language and just work with people to put things into kind of gradated levels of experience that you can maybe even experience in meditation or in your life. Um, and so if guest is small, this is really reductive. <laughs> I'm gonna get in trouble for saying it like this, but it's helpful. Uh, if guest is small self and host is big self, um, ultimate truth, then um, the guest and the guest is you trying to control you. It's like you just being run by your thoughts the way you always have and trying to like fix things and making your life a bigger mess by trying to make things better the way we always have. Mm -hmm. um, recognizing the guest within the host is some experience of you in your actual context. So it's some amount of the dust recognizes the room. The dust sees it as dust in room and kind of understands the way it works and seeing yourself in the perspective, like getting some sense of the interrelatedness of all things and how that plays into me, seeing that I am a creation of karma that goes back to before I was born, that I'm part of a process that started not 5 billion, 13 billion years ago and watching mm -hmm. how that plays out in me in my current moment and choices um, and kind of letting go of that because <laughs> you kind of have to, right? 14 billion yeah. years, what do you do with 14 <laughs> billion years? Um, that you can kind of relax. <laughs> yeah. That's kind of guest than the host, getting some perspective. And if you kind of got, if in sitting you kind of like see yourself like, oh, that's nice. And that can kind of be like a first, that can feel like a huge attainment actually. Be like, oh, there I yeah. am. I'm just yeah. one part of everything. Nice. Um, you can call that love. It's nice. Um, yeah. Host within the guest starts to get a little bit more, I would say, closer to real zen. Where um, you're now that's identifying with space without losing track of the dust, right? So you don't lose track of the little you, your little mind, your thoughts. You haven't bypassed them. You haven't crushed them. You haven't made yourself stop thinking or stop seeing yourself as a self. But that's not where your identification is. And this is why I hesitate with witness mind. It's a helpful um, mnemonic and device. But mm -hmm. witness mind is still localized. Identifying with the host is non-localized. That is the mind of the universe. It's the mind of God. It's a mind of grace. It's... Um, awareness that's not limited by your by you or your location 
Um, it's really all I can say about it. But yeah. it, it's there, and one can one can live like that for times. <laughs> yeah. No, that's beautiful. That was I when I heard that in the podcast. That was just kind of one of my favorite ideas that I've heard through a Zen text. Um, and and your commentary on it. And honestly, what you just said remind like so much of that kind of reminds me of like Advaita Vedanta, which is really interesting because I know that, you know, I mean, Advaita Vedanta was actually influenced by Buddhism by the time it mm -hmm. emerged. But like, um, still, there's that tension between, you know, kind of the Buddhists saying that there is no um, kind of what's the best word for it like i mean permanent is one way to say it but there there's there's like no constant you know but then um it seems like you know advaita vedanta is saying that we need to identify basically with exactly what you're saying identify with that um with with space or the absolute and so it it seems like they're kind of saying the same thing which is has always been kind of interesting to me Sort of, but that's where um, you asked me why I chose Zen over. Um, and again, I don't know much about Advaita Vedanta, so it might be, be, be being very reductive. But what I know of it um, in a lot of traditions is that the push and the trajectory is towards identifying with space, towards finding the host and um, living with the host and being, mm -hmm. becoming the host, right? And um, the last part of the formulation was to host, in the, host within the host. Mm -hmm. And that one's where it gets weird because that is the universe just identifying with the universe. Right. And so what do you do with that? Right. Because this is the joke. If you ever try in Zen terms, if you're ever trying to be the host within the host, that is purely guest within the guest. <laughs> that is um, the brain trying to control the brain, trying to control its experience. You're right back to small mind. That's how a small mind thinks. The mm -hmm. universe doesn't think like us. And so to actually experience that and to actually work with that is to let go of the notion of a self, is to let go of the notion of attainment. And mm -hmm. so anything that pushes you towards attainment or towards identification with something higher still has the trace of the guest. That is all about the guest. It's what the guest wants and what the guest is trying to do. And so to live as the host within the host, which actually we all, the point of Zen is that it's not something you do, it's something that is already always happening. It's actually yeah. what's playing out through you all the time. And whether you recognize it or not, doesn't change a whiff about it. That's why enlightenment is a, a kind of a joke. It's like, if you want to experience it, and sure, good for you. You could also yeah. learn to juggle or play basketball. We don't really care. <laughs> the host and the host is just what reality always was. It yeah. care if you see it or not. Right. Um, that to me is real deep. And that's kind of, so what happens in Zen is the ultimate truth is to just be yourself. Just do your thing the way you were. Just go about your life. Like it's the, um, the joke of the enlightened person is driving the cab, not teaching a multitude, you know? Um, it's, it's the baker, it's the janitor just happily sweeping the floor because that's what they're here born to do, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's where I like a tradition that grounds me back to this instead of taking me up to here. And I've yeah. seen, I actually haven't seen any that really do that. Um, even Zen can be really True. bad at it. Because um, for all of its good talk about it, its structures still like to put their figures on a pedestal. Right now, so we're trying to figure out with Zen in the West is how do we actually embody that idea that the janitor is the enlightened action, not the guru, when you actually do need institutions and teachers. It takes a lot of training to be able to teach this stuff properly and, and yeah. maturely. Um, and so how do you maintain the structures without putting things on pedestals and making it that trajectory of like, look to the host, you know? It's really hard, and I don't think we figured it out yet. <laughs> yeah. No, thank you. That's, that's awesome. I like how you the distinction between yeah because in, in Advaita Vedanta even though I think I personally think it's kind of saying the exact same thing that you're saying but I think the a lot of times the emphasis does feel like it's trying to lead to some kind of like well in some ways it is actually because there is that emphasis in Advaita Vedanta of like this here is just an illusion which I know we see in Buddhism as well but that's what I like about Zen too is that it's saying well no this this right here is the the ultimate reality doing what the ultimate reality is doing and mm -hmm. that includes you know the baker and the janitor like that's as real as it gets um so yeah i do actually i do feel uncomfortable sometimes with advaita vedanta because it does put like one of its main 
um, focuses is how much of an illusion this right here is. And I think that that can be that can cause people to be like really disembodied and like just be like, well, no, fuck this reality. I'm trying to get to something higher. And you're saying that Zen and I agree, I, I think Zen and Tantra I mean, I know that there's a, a bunch of different styles of Tantra, but ultimately, I think from my, you know, experience and, and reflection and research, it seems like Zen and Tantra are the two most kind of like down here um, spiritual traditions, I would say. Yeah, I don't, I, and again, I don't know enough about Advaita Vedanta, and they might even do a thing that Tantra does where it's provisional and higher teachings. And, and, and I know that uh, Advaita Vedanta and Tantra are actually much closer related than Zen is to Advaita Vedanta, so they might do the same thing. But a lot of times what happens is that they will use that kind of pursuit of a higher attainment to help liberate you a little bit, right? Because that does kind of, like, seeing this as an illusion is really helpful for taking a playful attitude towards sweeping the floor, right? Because mm -hmm. you're not so attached to getting a floor swept well <laughs> because your boss is mad at you, you know what I mean? Um, and once you do that, so in, in Tantra, from what I understand of it, is our first day teachings of, um, are their kind of like final secret teachings, which is that, that that pursuit of the higher thing was also an illusion. So the, the corollary to this is an illusion, which is true, is it also seeing this as an illusion is also an illusion. <laughs> <laughs> and so then what do you do, you know? And uh. So I don't know if that's where Vita Vedanta gets. I'm pretty positive that's where Tantra gets eventually. They yeah. just do it in defined gradations, and we refuse to, like, <laughs> you know, yeah. do the first gradation because we're just too elitist and stuck up. <laughs> <laughs> what, I, what I love is the moment in early Buddhism when they have um, – somebody asked Buddha how he knows he's enlightened. I think it was a like god asked Buddha how do he know he's enlightened. And he touches the ground, and he's like, by this. And that's what I think it is. It's like if you see through everything as an illusion – and you see that that awareness is also an illusion, and then you touch the ground, and just what is that? And that's that's real grounding. And I, there's no way to describe what that grounding is. It's just like, just by this, it's just this, you know. And that I think yeah. that's lovely. That makes me relax. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Well, um, you know, you said earlier that you feel like we are living in a mechanistic universe, um, and that made me sad a little bit when you said that. But uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering. Me too. Um, <laughs> I'm too sad to hear you say it. Back. <laughs> I'm wondering, like, in relationship to that, um, because oftentimes, you know, the worldview, you know, the view that we're living in a mechanistic universe is tied to, like, you know, scientific materialism and all that stuff, and um, and I'm wondering, like. From your own, all these years of doing zazen, um, what you know? What have you? What do you feel like you've learned about the the non physical components of reality? If that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Um, I guess. Well, first to qualify it, like the physical is important. That's kind of like the, what we're saying about like staying grounded and like what is right here is what matters. Like you know, yeah. when you touch the ground, like that is touching the ground, and there is yeah. clearly ground to touching there. <laughs> um, but I think the point that I've kind of gotten from Zazen is like, it's not just that you can't ignore that. Like math is still right. Like any tradition that tells me that four plus four, two plus two is not equal four, they're lying to me. You know? <laughs> yeah. But what does two plus two equal four mean? What the hell is four? What the hell is two? What do you mean by plus? You know, like these are questions that science can't answer, won't answer, and shouldn't try to, you know? Um, yeah. And that's where the mystery can kind of come back in. And you know, that's where actually, I think it's actually most of where we really play. Like two plus two equals four is very helpful, but it um, tells us very little about what we actually need to know. You mm -hmm. know, what is four for? What are we going to do with it? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so in Zazen, I guess. It's just this is why Zen gets good literature because it's very hard to describe. It becomes very poetic, you know. When um, I I can never find it again. Somebody once read a passage of Dogen where he's clearly studying zazen, and you know he kind of feels every cell in his body, and he feels just its aliveness and his buzzingness, and so it's not divorced from his cells, but it's not just cellular matter. You know, it's not about the matter. The matter is like doing something. That's the whole joke of trying to figure any of this stuff out. Is that 
before we think that science has ultimate answers, mm-hmm. um, we need to first recognize that the entire premise of trying to do science, we are starting with the biggest unknown that we can never solve, which is that what is the consciousness and what is the awareness that is even trying to understand where it exists? Mm-hmm. And if you can't answer that question, which we cannot answer that question, if somebody says they can, they're lying. <laughs> like, uh, uh, Princess Bride, they're probably trying to tell you something. Mm-hmm. Um, then you don't even understand the question you're asking. Mm-hmm. You know, I love how in science, like, you can have a, this happens a lot in history. They've had completely wrong theories that compl- completely accurately predict the way the solar system works, right? So, like, when we had a heliocentric, no, we had, we had what is the Earth centric one called? I always forget. I just call it Earth centric. So, yeah, so before a heliocentric uh, uh, solar system, when it was Earth centric, yeah. They did figure out how to plot the paths of the stars of the planets accurately. Right. They were just completely wrong in how they did it. You know, it's like all these like weird convoluted spirals and complicated math. And so the math worked and it accomplished what it needed to, but it was in no way a correct understanding. And yeah. every time we and same thing with like so Newton, his stuff, stuff still works on the smaller scale. But Einstein's like, well, that's not actually what time and space are. <laughs> Sorry, Newton. You know, doesn't mean Newton didn't work. And I think the same thing's happening with Einstein right now. He has this vision of time and space, of t- space time as a curved substance that does is really good for math. But obviously, it's not actually what's happening. It just kind of works. Yeah. So I think that's what our whole understanding of physical reality is. It works, but I'm pretty sure it's not what's happening. Yeah. You know? And so that mystery is. Um, when I said zazen, you have to engage with that mystery because you breathe. You stare at yourself breathing. You watch yourself breathing. And the, que- and the question of what is watching and what is breathing is just naturally present in the air. And so you just – you live in the answer that I can never express. You know, mm-hmm. It's already self-evident. And then the mind that even wonders how to answer or what is answering, that falls away too. Mm-hmm. I don't want to say the question becomes moot. It's still a question. That's why I think the word mystery is so helpful in religions and practices. But Mm -hmm. um, it's not a problem to be solved. Mm. It's lovely. Yeah. (laughs) I love that. (laughs) Yeah. Wow. Man. Um, Well, I have one more question. And, you know, we, we, you mentioned history a little bit there. So this, that's a good bridge, but you know, since you know so much about Zen history, I'm always like curious uh, about is there is there one event or or period of time in Zen history that is the most interesting to you? Yeah, there there is. I mean, there's a lot. <laughs> How long you got? <laughs> but um, no, the moment when I think I I, I see Zen form as a recognizable like the ironies and the jokes and the wits and the good literature. Um, come about in one moment that is again it's kind of a lockbox in time but I, you can kind of parse out I can have we can have theories on what happened so you can get mostly my own theory because I've studied this a lot and I kind of have a, my, my theories on why and how it happened mm-hmm. but because um, the, the classical age of Zen that they so in China the, when the Song Dynasty started in the year 1000 or so um, China had just gone through kind of a dark age a lot of civil war and a lot of bad record keeping um, of a few hundred years kind of like Europe did when the Sung Dynasty comes in in the year 1000, the lights kind of come back on, recorded history starts over again, and we see Zen as a fully formed entity with its kind of like flavor and jokes and literature like fully alive and flourishing. The previous few hundred years being kind of a dark age, we don't know quite why and how that happened or who formed it. We, what we have is legends. We have scraps of notes that monks had in their temples, the government all collected in the year 1000, and um, a, a story kind of develops. What had happened that had caused the dark age is my favorite time because – so. Americans should really study more Asian history because a lot happened in Asia, too, that we can learn from. Mm-hmm. The Anlushan Rebellion in, I think it was the year 760-something, um, was probably one of the greatest disasters in human history. What's funny about it is there's no good like moral narrative for why the war happened. A general got you know slighted by the emperor, got kind of jealous, thought it got kind of confident, started a civil war, tried to take over. And after a six-year period, two-thirds of China had been displaced or killed. Um, just like complete catastrophe you know like everything was burned um and in the middle of it the government is still trying to like loosely keep control and this one monk whose name gets forgotten in history like we tried he's still there but he's kind of buried as much as possible shen hui he was an amazing fundraiser for the government he's he was a chan monk he was a zen monk and what he would do is the government had to move to raise war funds they would sell ordinations to people because if you if you ordained you didn't have to pay taxes so a lot of people would ordain for the tax break 
So you pay a bunch of money up front and you don't pay taxes later. So it's a good deal for the aristocracy. And so, um, or you can be a true believer and do it for that reason too. So the government's shooting themselves in the foot by selling ordination certificates to raise money right away to lose money in the long run. You can see where, where society was going. But so Shen Hui was a phenomenal evangelizer for Zen. He would go out there and make these huge speeches on platforms and ordain like hundreds of thousands of people in a row. Because they're always like, whatever this guy's selling, I want that. You know, <laughs> that's amazing. Um, and so the government loved him. What he was doing, what he was saying, I think, is so funny. And this, this is where Zen won me over. His pitch was that everybody out there is selling you something. They're all telling you they're going to make something better. Um, Lushan, this guy, their, their whole regime says they're going to come in and make the country better. The uh, imperial government says if you let them back in, they're going to make things better. Every other religion, if you do our practices, you can escape this world of suffering and we can make things better. Um, me, I sell you nothing. And so this is like when, so when Zen pitched um, inherent perfection, when Zen pitched that everyone is already inherently enlightened. What his pitch was, and he's on a platform in the, ru the burned-out ruins of um, Chang'an, um, and what he's saying is, this is as good as it gets. This is the Bu Buddha's pure land. This is perfect. Nothing will ever make this better. And the, so the actual subtle pitch was, this is my interpretation, is that if everyone's telling you they're going to make it better, you can't trust them. I promise you nothing. You can trust me. And I'm like, you know mm -hmm. what? I trust that because everyone has promised me they can make things better, and they're always lying to me. They're selling mm -hmm. something. He was selling literally nothing. And... But the ultimate truth of that, I do think, goes deep. And I, I don't know if he was being savvy, if he was really sincerely understood that, or if he just like had a good pitch, or he was just jaded and thought he was being funny. I don't know what, what Chen Hui was thinking. But I know that like looking around at the burned out ruins of your life and telling yourself this is as good as it gets, what did you think you wanted out of this? And actually, and really, truly, not just being jaded there, like really, truly finding the beauty in that, that is the only thing I know how to rely on now. Because my life never went the way I wanted it to. <laughs> I'm kind of mm -hmm. jaded. You know, and that's mm. one thing that no one can ever take away from you. If you can look out the burned out ruins of your life and be mm. like, this is Buddha's per perfect enlightened pure land. No one can hurt you. Nothing can yeah. hurt you. That's Oof. liberation. <laughs> Beautiful. There that's a great way to end. Dave, this was so good. <laughs> Thanks, for real. Matthew. Thank you. I really enjoyed all your answers as always. And thank you for your wisdom and knowledge and presence. And I'm sure we'll have a part three sometime. Thank you so much. Uh, I love talking about the stuff and I love your questions and uh, I love to be on here. Thank you so much. Awesome. See you soon, Dave. Peace. Bye, Matthew. <laughs> Bye.